Welcome to our first session as part of St. George's University examination on coronavirus COVID-19. So we begin this examination where it began, with animals, as we introduce background, context, and a comparative approach as it relates to the current coronavirus crisis. At St. George's University, we are very happy to have with us our president, Dr. G. Richard Olds, who is an experienced expert in the area of infectious diseases. So certainly we are very fortunate to have with us Dr. Olds to begin the conversation as it relates to COVID-19. Dr. Olds, welcome to our course and thank you for joining us in this examination of COVID-19. Uh, thank you, Satish. Um, I hope you can uh, see uh, side by side my uh, slide deck that I prepared. You'll see that uh, uh, for today's uh, presentation, I uh, entitle it Revenge of the Animals. I'd like uh, to uh, suggest that I got this idea actually uh, from Diamond's book, uh, Guns, Germs, and Steel. That uh, um, uh, best-selling book had as its premise why certain races of people uh, ended up dominating the world and why others did not. And in that middle group, germs, uh, he hypothesized that uh, the ability of certain races of people to survive animal viruses was a key factor in the evolution of man over time. And here again, we are dealing with a virus that likely came from an animal source that made the species jump uh, to humans and is causing a major uh, health problem uh, worldwide today. And I'm going to discuss today a bit about uh, viruses that make the species jump into humans and the impact, if you will, of uh, uh, microbes and humans uh, as we battle them through the centuries. So let me, uh, let me start by pointing out that the idea that a pathogen of originally animal origin could become a major health problem for humans is certainly not a new idea. As you'll recall, the Black Death in, in, uh, during the Middle Ages was probably responsible for almost a third of the human population dying. And that was a uh, bacterial infection in that uh, particular case that was transmitted uh, from rats to human beings through fleas and had a devastating impact on the human populations almost uh, uh, a thousand years ago. Now, this is not a new idea. The idea that a newly introduced pathogen uh, causes a great deal of uh, uh, morbidity and mortality in human populations. And interestingly, we have some examples of new introductions. In this case, I'm gonna talk about known human pathogens, but human pathogens that had never seen uh, populations of humans. And uh, you may recall the discussion of the introduction of syphilis uh, following uh, Christopher Columbus's uh, travel to the New World into Europe, and syphilis was a far more lethal and devastating disease soon after its introduction in the human population than it became two or three hundred years later. The reverse was also true, uh, undoubtedly through either Christopher Columbus's initial or subsequent trips or through subsequent uh, uh, landings of Europeans, uh, those in the New World suffered terribly from our diseases that they had not seen previously, including measles and tuberculosis and a variety of other pathogens. Uh, nicely recounted in, in the book uh, uh, 1491, uh, where they uh, 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 hypothesized that uh, uh, the population of the New World was actually considerably larger than we thought, but was killed off by these human pathogens that were newly introduced to a naive human population. Now, what I'd like to suggest is that when viral pathogens particularly are introduced in between the severity of the illness and the success of the pathogen, now when we think about it, it is not that the pathogen's survival advantage to rapidly kill the host. Uh, remember that uh, viral pathogens require living tissue in them 
and the internal mechanism of cellular mechanism of living uh, tissue to actually propagate. It does not have the ability to multiply and live on its own, like bacteria or protozoa or other uh, infectious pathogens of man. So it's not to the advantage of the pathogen to kill you. So highly lethal, um, uh, but not as successful as human pathogens, because uh, it is a better survival advantage for the pathogen uh, to um, induce symptoms or, or uh, activities that uh, help propagate it from person to person, and obviously for people to be infectious for long periods of time, maximizing the likelihood that the, the virus can find another suitable host to carry on its replication. Now, I'll just give you a couple examples, and although this was a linear diagram, I don't mean to, to, to suggest that they're exactly linear, but when you think about it, you know, the common cold is an extremely uh, effective, uh, and the reason for that is it's very easily transmitted, and it uh, generally doesn't kill people, and they tend to have symptoms for a long time, and the coughing and sneezing and various activities induced by the virus actually help it replicate. Now, measles is probably the most infectious, uh, if you will, um, a pathogen of man. Um, the last case of measles I saw um, uh, acquired the measles in a hospital emergency room, actually a waiting room, and six hours before, a measles case merely passed through that waiting room. And then six hours later, a person who had never been immunized walked through that waiting room and got measles. Now, that is a very infectious pathogen. And, uh, and of course, uh, measles, with the exception of small children, where it has a fairly significant mortality rate, is generally not fatal. Now, on the other end of the extreme, most of us are familiar with Ebola, uh, where uh, you know, we have a very high case fatality rate, uh, but it's not a very successful pathogen, or at least it hasn't been, uh, because it uh, appears uh, historically in isolated villages in Africa, and it is so rapidly lethal that it's difficult for it to actually be transmitted from person to person. So those are all sort of examples of the, of the variation between severity of illness and, uh, and success as a human pathogen. Now, we're going to be talking in this uh, in lecture series about uh, coronaviruses as a group and the uh, COVID-19 specifically. <clears throat> so with that idea in mind, let's take a look at the three known um, uh, novel coronaviruses that have affected human populations uh, fairly significantly, SARS, MERS, and the new COVID-19. Now, as we'll discuss later, MERS uh, is, highly, is clearly the most fatal, uh, but it is also uh, not very easily transmitted from person to person. So the number of cases that were actually affected by MERS, despite its very high uh, fatality rate, was small. SARS, which was the first one that we dealt with, has a pretty significant mortality rate, a little under 10%, and it was more successfully transmitted from person to person. The COVID-19 that we're dealing with today has a much lower mortality rate compared to SARS and MERS. It's about two to 3%. Now that's 20 to 30 times a higher mortality rate than the flu, but compares to its other coronavirus uh, uh, relatives, it is less fatal. But on the other hand, it's far more effective as a pathogen from the standpoint of transmissibility from person to person. Now, I always like to return you know, in the background to uh, look at fact versus fiction. This is one of my favorite books written by Michael Crichton, a physician himself. Uh, and as you'll recall, the plot line ultimately made into a movie of Andromeda strain is a satellite from space crashes into a remote village in New Mexico uh, uh, unbeknownst at the time, uh, it carried a, a deadly pathogen from outer space, and over a very short period of time, it killed everyone in this remote village except for an old man and a small baby. Uh, the CDC came in with its hazmat uniforms, et cetera. They isolated the viruses. They built a containment unit, and uh, toward the end of the movie, you'll recall that uh, the virus got out of containment, and it looked like the world was lost and it mutated into a non-lethal form. Now that's a pretty fantastic plot line uh, uh, that, that I'll be made into a movie. Now, a few years later, another book, The Hot Zone by Richard Preston was written and its plot line is interesting. A man 
stumbles out of a, a cave in remote Africa and becomes desperately sick. Uh, all the doctors and nurses that take care of him uh, uh, become sick and many of them die. And uh, that virus was never seen previously in human populations. And they suddenly discovered that the, the virus had gotten as far as Renston, uh, Virginia, uh, in, the, in the body of uh, macaque monkeys from the Philippines. And the, it looked like the world would be lost. And then they discovered that that virus had mutated in a non-lethal form for humans and the world was safe. <laughs> that happens to be a true story. So I guess the point is, is Mother Nature can come up with uh, much scarier plot lines often than we can as human beings. Now, I also want to make an uh, analogy between uh, those that are finding a cure for, for cancer and those that are fighting to find a cure for diseases like COVID-19. Now here you'll see a, sort of a, a picture from the, from the Great Depression of building a skyscraper. Uh, I think this was in New York City. The point I'm trying to make is that in this particular case, the adversary, specific cancers, don't change. And as a result of that stability, if you will, of your adversary, finding a cure for cancer is like building a skyscraper. You build layer by layer, floor by floor, until finally you end up conquering the disease. And the advantage that you have is the cancer itself doesn't change. The, you know, the lung cancer or colon cancer that uh, is present today is probably the same colon cancer that was present 100, 200 years ago. So the stability, if you will, of your adversary makes research and development of cures of cancer, uh, you know, a, a obtainable, although the time is unknown, it will eventually be conquered. Now, in contrast, infectious diseases are a very different uh, challenge. And the reason for that is that uh, many infectious diseases, and particularly the viruses that we're going to be talking about today, require living in human tissue. And so the viruses that are alive today are real survivors of millions of years uh, of uh, changing environments. And among the strategies that those infectious pathogens uh, use is their ability to mutate, change, et cetera. In fact, that very malleability, if you will, of, of the infectious pathogens is what makes it so difficult to ultimately conquer uh, infectious diseases. Because the infectious diseases that we're fighting today are likely different than the infectious diseases that affected human populations 100 years ago, 300 years ago, et cetera. And they may in fact change over the course of a relatively short period of time uh, so that fighting infectious diseases, about the best we can do is uh, block or checkmate specific viruses as they uh, evolve, as they uh, basically affect human populations. But it's very difficult to go back prior to that and try to eliminate uh, basically the emergence of infectious diseases because likely uh, infectious diseases, new infectious diseases have emerged into human populations for millions of years and it's likely that uh, they're going to continue to do so for the next several decades. So it is not realistic to think that the success that we have had historically in cancer research for example and other areas is, is going to be reached with infectious diseases as quickly or as completely, and that has to do with the variability of our adversary. Nor is the idea that as a man, you know, uh, comes in contact with new environments uh, that, uh, you know, diseases don't arise. This is uh, Dr. Gorgas, and this is basically at the building of the Panama Canal. Now, I'll remind people that the French didn't uh, fail building the Panama Canal because they weren't good engineers. In fact, they were probably great engineers. They had a great plan. But they couldn't build the Panama Canal because uh, the workers kept dying of yellow fever. So until Dr. Gorgas devised a strategy to at least deal with uh, yellow fever, it was not possible to build the Panama Canal. And ultimately, the success of the United States in building that through the isthmus of uh, Panama was directly related to their ability to control, uh, if you will, yellow fever endemic in that area. Now, these rainforest viruses like yellow fever are examples of infectious diseases that are often from other animal species, and they are geographically isolated from human populations because the density of humans in the rainforest has historically been very small. But as we encroach into these new areas, 
Uh, and basically, uh, we bring human populations in direct proximity with animals and potentially animal viruses that they've not previously seen in large numbers, and uh, that therefore increases the likelihood of the species jump to humans. And we have had many examples, if you will, uh, of rainforest viruses that uh, whose natural host is uh, some animal uh, in the rainforest that has been able to make that successful jump. Now, when we talk about a virus coming from another species into humans, recall that two steps are critical in it becoming a health problem for humans. Obviously, the first step is the virus has to be able to jump from one species to another species. Now, recall that uh, uh, you know viruses become very well adapted to specific species of animals, and fortunately, uh, they do not pass easily from one species to another. And we should know that the, the genetic uh, similarity between different species obviously help that. So uh, monkeys can transmit and chimpanzees can transmit uh, many more diseases to humans than let's say dogs and cats. And that's because of the genetic similarity. Having said that, we know that the ability to transmit viruses from one species to another occurs periodically, but probably at a relatively low frequency. Now, once that happens, the particular index case, you know, can get sick with the virus, could even die from the virus, but a second step is necessary for this to become an international health problem, and that is the second ability which is of the ability of the virus to be transmitted from person to person successfully. Now, let's just take a couple examples of uh, viruses in the recent past that have made the news. You may recall the bird flu. There was a great deal of concern about the bird flu, and that's because a virus was able to be transmitted from uh, uh, birds directly to humans with a fairly high fatality rate, uh, by the way. But fortunately, that particular virus was not very successful in being transmitted from person to person to person. There were a couple cases that were transmitted to people, but it required very high density of the viruses and very close proximity. So it wasn't very successful, if you will, as a pathogen of humans, even though it was highly lethal to those that became initially infected. Now, we see this uh, phenomenon all the time in the annual flu seasons, a recombination of uh, viruses occur largely in waterfowl in central China. They then often are transmitted through an intermediate species, often pigs. Pigs have the unfortunate uh, ability to have more than one virus uh, infect them at the same time, and there allows a reassortment of the viral genomes in the pig, and emerging from the pig uh, are often new uh, flu viruses that affect human beings. And as we know, influenza is capable of uh, being passed from person to person as it does on an annual basis. So two steps, the ability to jump from one species to another, and then the second property, uh, its ability to be transmitted from person to person to person. And those are common dynamics in all emerging viral pathogens. Now we've had an example of uh, some pretty significant animal viruses. Uh, that have made the species jump to human beings with fairly large impacts. Probably the greatest is the swine flu or so-called Spanish flu epidemic of 1918. Uh, we probably will talk about that again with our current um, uh, discussions of COVID-19. Recall that this was a relatively minor, by comparison, illness when it first arose. It actually then uh, moved uh, uh, to the Southern Hemisphere and people thought that it had gone away and it came back with a vengeance the following year with a much higher uh, fatality rate. And as you'll recall, uh, there was a significant death rate, not so much because of the individual mortality rate, which actually wasn't that much higher than uh, COVID-19, but because the virus was so effective in infecting uh, literally millions and millions of human beings. Now, we don't tend to think of it this way, but recall that the HIV AIDS epidemic in the 80s was probably originally caused by a species jump of a retrovirus from the lesser chimpanzee in Central Africa, perhaps during the building of the Trans-African uh, Highway, and then eventually evolved into a, a virus that obviously has uh, international impacts on human populations. One of my favorites, and although less well published, is the monkeypox uh, outbreak in 
uh, northern United States, which uh, was basically a virus that had been endemic in West and Central Africa for thousands of years. It wasn't actually even discovered until we eradicated smallpox, and it was imported into the United States in a pouched Gambian rat transmitted to prairie dogs. Prairie dogs were sold at uh, fairs in Wisconsin and Minnesota and were ultimately transmitted to human beings. So uh, clearly it is possible for viruses in remote uh, areas of the world in another species to ultimately become problems here in the United States. And as you'll recall, the most recent is the uh, last Ebola uh, uh, outbreak. Ebola in, prior to that had largely remained in isolated villages in Africa. And when it finally got to a village in West Africa with a much more dense population, it became an international health problem. And as you'll recall, we had several cases in the United States. Now, let's talk specifically about the coronavirus itself. So now coronaviruses are fairly common. They are common viruses of both animals and humans. Uh, some coronaviruses that have adapted mostly to human populations are uh, those, about 25% of the common cold viruses are coronaviruses. There are three uh, coronaviruses that are largely animal viruses that have made that species jump to humans, and we're going to talk more about those. Those are SARS, MERS, and of course COVID-19. Now, the problem with the, uh, the uh, coronaviruses, among other things, is that they present with symptoms that are not very distinguishable from a variety of other uh, common uh, viral illnesses, so that in their initial presentation they may, be, uh, they may appear to be just another common cold. The virus itself is a non-segmented positive sense RNA virus, and I'm sure the microbiologists will talk more about the viral structure and its makeup in subsequent lectures. Now, it's called a coronavirus uh, largely because on scanning EM, uh, and there are little, what appear to be small crowns covering the viral envelope. Now let's take a look at those three coronaviruses that uh, have affected human populations. And, and I mentioned them earlier when I showed you the graph, but this is basically the actual numerical data. As you'll recall, SARS and MERS, which are not currently active uh, health problems of humans, uh, SARS affected about 8,000 people and MERS less, about 2,500. But notice uh, that the fatality rates uh, were very high for MERS, 34% and a little under 10% for SARS. Now in contrast, COVID-19 has obviously affected a much larger percentage of humans and uh, is still growing. And the mortality rate is somewhere between two and 3%. <clears throat> now, <coughs> we, <clears throat> now we know that the uh, a host now of SARS, which we only discovered after the epidemic, that the original um, uh, host is likely to be bats, and that the bats uh, transmitted to civet cats in China, and those civet cats were probably responsible for the original species jump to human beings. MERS, also a natural pathogen of bats, um, may have been transmitted to humans through camels, since uh, they fairly commonly infect camels. Now, we don't know exactly where the COVID-19 virus comes from, but I'll talk in a few minutes about what evidence we have uh, that would suggest that uh, it may in fact come from an animal reservoir. The incubation periods for all three of these viruses are about the same, and interestingly, the fatality rate as seen in all three of them uh, seems to be associated with very high levels of circulating cytokines, uh, which are undoubtedly driven by the host's uh, uh, attempts to fight uh, widespread viral infection. Now this is a map of, <clears throat> this is from uh, February, showing you how uh, the coronavirus has spread from its original outbreak in Wuhan, China, throughout many sections of China, and as you know, it has spread through many areas of the world. And uh, this particular map uh, um, obviously is going to change over time, and as it changes over time, uh, obviously our response from a, a public health standpoint will change. Now this is just to show you that this is no longer a issue of China itself. We used to feel comfortable that if we could do something with people that had recently visited China in the last two weeks, uh, you know, or people that are arriving from China and we are looking for those with symptoms and certainly with those with fever, this is merely looking at where the exposure site was over time. And as you can see, that strategy might well have been effective uh, early in the epidemic when the vast majority of 
cases uh, had their uh, origin in central China, in Wuhan specifically. And as over time, obviously that has changed. So now we have uh, many areas of the world where there's community-based transmission. We can no longer use its associated uh, association with Wuhan, China as a uh, marker for those that we should be concerned about. And this is just showing you the same thing as time goes on, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> I, by the way, have not been to Wuhan, China <clears throat> in recent years. Uh, you'll see uh, that, uh, again, we're now having to investigate where all of the uh, documented cases are coming from. And as you can see, uh, they're increasingly coming from uh, uh, countries uh, that uh, obviously had the virus enter through a person who had originally had contact with Wuhan, China, but now transmission is taking place from person to person. Now, what, where did COVID-19 come from? Well, we don't know in, uh, for sure, and I think that we probably won't know in, except maybe in retrospect, but uh, we know that the other two human uh, coronaviruses, SARS and MERS, came from uh, other species. And the first cases of COVID-19 were found in individuals who had epidemiologically attended a large seafood and live animal market in Wuhan, China, obviously strongly suggesting that an animal somewhere in that, wild, that live animal market was sick and transmitted that virus to uh, human beings who subsequently then transmitted it to other humans. So um, uh, that is probably at least our best knowledge at the moment, where the COVID-19 came from. Now, <clears throat> unfortunately, the symptoms in the beginning, as I mentioned, are, uh, you know, are not very severe. And generally, the onset of illness is usually between four and seven days. Now, you undoubtedly have heard of the incubation period of 14 days. Uh, that's the known maximal incubation period, or at least suspected maximal incubation period but most of the cases actually occur much sooner than that. So usually within less than a week of having contact with someone with COVID-19, symptoms begin. And symptoms are generally fever, cough, respiratory symptoms. And usually the first um, symptom that develops that is of concern is shortness of breath. Then the patient, if you will, that starts with these flu-like uh, syndromes uh, you know, that shortness of breath uh, uh, progresses, especially in those that uh, are going to have a worse outcome, and they become progressively more short of breath, often requiring hospitalization. Uh, and those that are going to have a poor outcome when uh, they do a chest x-ray or on exam appear to have pneumonia. And then they go later in the course of the disease into acute respiratory distress syndrome, so-called ARDS, and ultimately that progresses to death. Now, the average time from the onset of symptoms to the, uh, the development of severe disease, let's say transferring a patient to an intensive care unit, is about eight days. So you can see that in contrast to other uh, viral pathogens where um, uh, death can be quite quick, for instance, the Spanish flu epidemic killed perfectly healthy young people in their 30s within days, this particular illness uh, takes a while to develop. Uh, often, in addition to the respiratory uh, um, symptoms, uh, kidney failure can occur late in disease. And as I mentioned earlier, the ARDS is uh, probably caused by extreme cytokine storm induced by the virus. It's not possible to blunt this particularly effectively because we wouldn't use corticosteroids uh, because this uh, would allow even greater viral replication. So we at the moment do not have a particularly effective way of dealing with this disease. Well, how is it transmitted? Well, we know that it's more effectively transmitted than SARS and MERS. Most secondary cases, though, have involved fairly close contact with infected people. So based on uh, initial observations made in China, and based on our experience with other coronaviruses, contact is the most common means of transmission, uh, touching infected people, doorknob surfaces, or uh, basically coming in contact uh, with the uh, lipid droplet uh, transmission. In fact, lipid droplet transmission is probably the, the common pathway for both of those uh, transmission risks. Now, risk behavior from uh, whether it's uh, uh, having contact with the case or uh, being in close proximity to the case uh, 
often involves touching the mouth, nose, or eyes, uh, which where the virus can basically uh, um, begin propagating within an infected host. Now, droplet transmission is probably the, the major focus since it may be the most important uh, way of transmission. Now, remember that the droplet transmission is propagated by coughing and sneezing, et cetera. And, uh, but those droplets uh, uh, basically are fairly heavy. And so they can't remain in the air for long periods of time and they don't travel great distances. So interestingly, uh, most of the cases have been within six feet of the, of the patient. And uh, um, uh, current recommendations, as you'll see, uh, is to stay at least three feet from an infected person because uh, both from a contact standpoint and from a lipid droplet standpoint, uh, uh, the risk of acquiring the infection uh, decreases substantially the farther away that you are from the patient. Now, true airborne transmission, like what we discussed in measles, probably doesn't occur. Remember that measles case where somebody walked through um, a waiting room breathing or coughing, and then six, seven hours later, another person comes in and breathes the same air and, and contracts the virus. The virus probably is not very efficient in being transmitted in that way. Although you would, <clears throat> you would probably say that droplet transmission is in fact airborne in that sense, but because the droplets themselves are fairly heavy, they don't tend to travel nearly as far as uh, you know, air exchanges. And you don't see things like smallpox where uh, people that uh, are quite distant from the, from the cases but share the same air uh, can become subsequently infected. So what do we do to prevent it? Well, again, you, and this uh, now is uh, hopefully fairly common knowledge that among the things that are most important is good hand washing uh, and uh, either uh, with open water or with any of the alcohol-based gels. <clears throat> and you have undoubtedly heard that uh, the use of masks are best for the people who have active symptoms because what you're trying to do is cut down on the contamination of the environment of those lipid droplets that are uh, virally infected. And so putting the mask on somebody that's sneezing or coughing, et cetera, will obviously cut down on contamination of the environment uh, of that particular person's lipid droplets. Now, many people with COVID-19 have only mild symptoms and uh, those still need to be quarantined because they probably still can shed viruses. And this is important as we think about prevention because for instance, in the United States, uh, people you know, uh, generally will go to work when they're not deathly sick. That's sort of the culture that we have established. And here we're very likely to tell people, especially people that are, uh, you know, that are at risk, uh, to basically self-quarantine and not have contact with other individuals despite the fact that many of those people in quarantine are perfectly well at the time they're quarantined. And when they first become sick, they don't feel that bad. And so for this reason, this is uh, why in the case of SARS and in MERS, they basically eliminated uh, uh, large groups of individuals uh, congregating because there are gonna be people in that environment who are not very sick, but are still capable of transmitting the disease. Now, wearing masks to prevent getting the disease is a more controversial issue, and you'll see that people are doing that, uh, but it's controversial in the sense that uh, if it reminds the person not to touch their eyes or nose or mouth, then I suppose that's useful, but the common surgical masks that you see would not prevent somebody from inhaling the lipid droplets associated with a person that is infected. So in that sense, it's not uh, that helpful in, in preventing disease in, an ace in a person that's not yet infected. Uh, so uh, generally speaking, we don't recommend that people wear masks to prevent getting illness. What we uh, tell them to do is obviously stay away from sick people, wash your hand or use uh, alcohol-based swabs, and uh, you know try to uh, uh, minimize the contact that you have with people that may be transmitting the virus, i.e. people that have uh, respiratory illnesses. Now, caregivers is a different issue. Now we're talking about how do we protect caregivers uh, from uh, contracting the virus themselves uh, when they're caring for patients that uh, basically have either documented or suspected uh, COVID-19. Well, here we have to protect them with uh, full gowns and gloves, very much like you would see in a hospital in uh, protecting uh, healthcare workers from um, um, 
C. difficile uh, infection in hospitals. Uh, so they'll have the booties, they'll have gloves, they'll have a full paper gown and a hood. But in addition, they're going to need eye protection because of the ability to, to be transmitted probably through the conjunctival sac of the eye. And R95 or equivalent respirator uh, masks, which uh, uh, do uh, have a, a, a seal uh, so that they cut down on the ability to breathe in lipid droplets. And this is a similar approach that uh, has been used with uh, other coronaviruses. Uh, now, the use of, if you will, spacesuits, which is very common in the case of Ebola, uh, is uh, recommended principally for those that have basically a facilitated way of generating lipid droplets in the environment, such as those that are, have uh, tracheostomies, those that are intubated, et cetera. So people that are dealing with individuals in that setting uh, need to generally have a higher level of protection. Now, how do we diagnose this disease? Well, if we're fortunate because of the previous experience with MERS and SARS, uh, we relatively quickly were able to develop a rapid test, which is now available in several countries, uh, which uh, in the case of the CDC is a reverse transcriptase preliminary chain reaction test. Now, this test can be, uh, is available today through the CDC in about 48 to 72 hours if you can get them to run the tests, but it's technically possible to uh, run this test in, in a matter of hours. And, uh, but to do that, we would have to have the ability to do testing in um, much more diverse uh, settings than we have today. But at least we have the technology to make the diagnosis of COVID-19 relatively rapidly, but we have to uh, ramp up the ability to generate a lot of tests. I'll point out, for instance, that Korea is currently testing over a thousand people a day. So obviously uh, we're gonna have to have a much greater capacity to test for COVID-19 in the very near future. Now, currently there's no treatment for COVID-19. It's largely supportive care. Uh, now that's not to minimize the importance of that. I'll rec uh, recall that Ebola, which is a much more uh, highly fatal disease, uh, we learned through the heroic uh, measures of many uh, 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 infectious disease specialists that treated uh, those cases of uh, Ebola. And if you can keep the patient alive long enough, uh, they can survive and uh, they may well have lifelong immunity. So supportive care is very important. At the current time, uh, we have not seen success uh, in, in doing that with uh, those that are severely ill with COVID-19, but fortunately the mortality rates is considerably lower. Now, there are currently clinical trials with several antiviral drugs. And the last one that I've listed here is uh, actually not only in clinical trials, but because uh, it was used earlier in MERS, it appears to work in animals uh, to prevent transmission and in animals on, or early on the onset of symptoms uh, to minimize the disease. So, uh, you know, uh, again, uh, there may be drugs in the pipeline, but it's not likely that these will become widely available uh, to patients in the very near future because we have yet to determine their exact clinical efficacy when they should be used. And of course, they've not been produced in large numbers. Now, you've seen in the news uh, recently a lot of discussion about uh, a COVID-19 vaccine. And again, we have the advantage of having had investigators working on MERS and SARS uh, earlier so that uh, uh, the time from the onset of this illness to our ability to potentially uh, uh, produce an effective vaccine has been greatly shortened, but it hasn't been greatly shortened so that we're gonna have a vaccine in the very near future. So there's no currently vaccine available, uh, and uh, there are several vaccines under development. There's a messenger RNA-based vaccine that basically uh, uh, submits the, if you will, the code that encodes for a, a critical protein uh, in uh, COVID-19 uh, into a viral vector that basically is used as an immunization. And there is a vaccine based on the spike protein, uh, which uh, uh, is a uh, particular protein unique to the COVID-19 uh, virus. And the, they are currently uh, using it with an adjuvant in the attempt to develop immunity based on uh, developing neutralizing antibody to that protein. Now, what have we learned from the past? I think it's, uh, we've talked a lot about lots of other viruses that have made the species jump to human beings. And we've uh, talked about uh, 
you know, what are some of the lessons that we learned. So uh, let me point out, it's already happened, but uh, that public stigmatization around this issue has already taken place. I remember with the Ebola outbreak uh, in Texas, where there were two cases in healthcare workers, uh, parents kept their children home from a grade school in Houston, Texas, because the, the um, uh, principal of the school was from Africa. Uh, the fact that the uh, principal had not been to the continent of Africa for, for decades uh, didn't do much to uh, uh, keep the parents from keeping the kids home from that school. That was obviously uh, fear irrationally generated by the fact that the fact that the Ebola outbreak started in Africa, therefore all Africans are to be feared. Now you can see this has already happened. As you'll recall, a Chinese individual graduate student was unable to get in a room in uh, London, despite the fact that she hadn't been to China in a long period of time, because she was Chinese. Now, because this particular epidemic is rapidly becoming now an issue in Italy and Germany and, and Korea and other places, I hope that stigmatization is not going to continue, but you, uh, you can recall that there's a fair amount of concern that then gets based on a racial basis because of the origin of this virus. Well, this is uh, clearly, although it may bear a uh, name, uh, some people refer to as the Wuhan coronavirus, in the very near future, this will be a international health concern, having uh, relatively uh, a little uh, direct uh, relationship to China in the future. Now, just as in the past, uh, vaccines and drugs are very important to develop, but they will likely not be around in time to control this particular epidemic. And so, you know, this particular epidemic will need to be controlled just as SARS and MERS were through very good public health measures, including quarantine uh, of potential cases, uh, caring for cases with proper protection for the healthcare workers. And unfortunately, we have not invested heavily in public health as uh, developed countries. And uh, even in the United States, our public health infrastructure has been greatly weakened over the years as has been cuts in funding to places like the CDC and, and you know, public health infrastructures in states and on a national level. So we're starting a bit behind because obviously people uh, without having had a major public health threat have failed to realize the importance uh, of really good public health. Now, Borders, uh, uh, you know, in our country and every country increasingly need to focus not just on security from, you know, uh, potential uh, uh, people that are going to do harm to travelers, but remember that uh, increasingly we are going to need to be able to screen travelers. I'll point out that the United States is really behind in this area. Uh, even a decade ago, many Asian uh, countries had the ability to rapidly uh, determine who had a fever in airports, in, for instance, in Hong Kong and Singapore. And uh, that capacity is really not present in most of the US uh, cities and certainly uh, not present in any of the Caribbean countries in large numbers. And so now we are left with having to determine uh, temperatures of individuals by individually examining their, uh, them for uh, elevated temperatures. And let me just close by the, you know, the general statement that people have a lot more to fear from Mother Nature, given our history, both recent and remote, than they do from ISIS. Uh, international health uh, problems uh, are uh, problems of the whole world. And nothing happens, even in the most remote corner of the world, that doesn't ultimately become a problem for everyone. So I'm gonna stop there, as I hope this was at least a good introduction to uh, COVID-19 and the current coronavirus um, uh, uh, situation. Uh, we're gonna have subsequently speakers that will obviously go into greater detail about certain aspects of the virus, uh, but I, uh, I'd be glad to enter questions that you might have about my presentation or more general questions about the coronavirus COVID-19 problem today. Thank you very much, Dr. Rose. We appreciate your presentation. And from what I gather, there is a lot that we know about COVID-19. There's a lot that we do not know. And there's a lot that you said as well at the same time. So we are very happy at St. George's University to join the conversation globally as we continue to examine and continue to bring persons towards addressing and responding 
to this not only individual, but certainly global issue as is COVID-19. What is interesting, Dr. Wills, is that in your presentation at the beginning, you highlighted the fact that many of these infectious diseases have an animal source. And that is part of the, the One Health Initiative, recognizing that human health is inextricably linked to that of animals and the environment. Now, a lot of the animal source reports suggest wildlife, suggest bats, for example, as well. We've had some news outbreaks in terms of persons considering pet animals uh, as, as maybe serving as a source, domestic animals. With regards to COVID-19, which animal sources you think we should be more, most concerned about, not in terms of the source, per se in Wuhan, wet markets, for example, but in terms of the, the, the global distribution and spread? Well, <clears throat> This is a currently unknown with this particular virus. Uh, if we were guessing, if you will, from uh, MERS and SARS, it's likely to be fairly species restricted. So it's unlikely that let's say all mammalian animals uh, can transmit this virus. That, that's unlikely, although we haven't proved it one way or the other. You know, and currently uh, common household pets like cats and dogs, et cetera, you know, maybe even birds and, you know, uh, parakeets and et cetera, uh, um, are not known whether they can transmit the disease or become infected. You may recall that there was a fair amount of concern about a pet dog that uh, we're not sure if that uh, particular dog was uh, sick with the virus, was capable of transmitting the virus, or merely because the dog may well have had lipid droplets from uh, their owner that, that had COVID-19 uh, tested possible positive. Recall that one of the advantages of the reverse transcriptase uh, type uh, diagnostic tests is they're extremely sensitive because even a couple of viral copies can be amplified with that technology so that you know that that is not only that specific virus because it has that specific uh, you know, genome in it, uh, but it uh, can find very, very minute quantities of material. This is why this uh, technology is often now used in forensics. Uh, the drawback of that is, is that obviously contamination uh, is a huge problem uh, because, uh, you know, if one viral uh, particle is present, let's say, on the coat of a dog, it might get picked up and you know you couldn't conclude that the dog was capable of transmitting the disease, but in a sense the dog could be just like a doorknob or a, a you know a, an environmental surface. It's capable of having the virus live on that surface for a period of time, which is capable of being picked up. So that a person that has a dog, for instance, and has COVID-19, if somebody came in and petted the dog, they, they it would be very much like. Uh, you know, handling the doorknob uh, of uh, the patient's room that was sick, et cetera. So uh, the difficulty we're gonna have is until we do more active research, we really won't know whether the animals that have very common um, interaction with human beings are capable of transmitting the virus. At the present time, I think the conclusion is if you're isolating uh, uh, patients you should probably isolate their pets with them, uh, you know, for that reason. But at the, at the current time, uh, I will doubt that it's probably dogs and cats that are transmitting this particular virus. It's unlikely, for instance, but not impossible, that this live animal market uh, has some other species that was responsible for this transmission. We just don't know what it was. Sure, exactly. And as you explained, new viruses eventually become established pathogens for humans based on the success of the pathogen and the severity of the illness as well. From what we know thus far with regards to the success of COVID-19 as a pathogen and the severity of, of the illness itself, from a prediction perspective, how would you envisage the longevity of, of COVID-19 in the human population? Well, if you're thinking of it from a infectivity standpoint, not from a mortality standpoint, but from an infectivity standpoint, it's probably about as infectious as influenza. Now, 
if you take that as an example, influenza is uh, obviously has a much lower case fatality rate. Uh, the fatality rate currently for influenza is about 0.1%, and uh, the fatality rate for the COVID-19 is 2 to 3%, but they're about equally infectious. So we've not been terribly successful in dealing with influenza, despite the fact that we have both effective drugs uh, and we have an effective vaccine, uh, we still have uh, influenza outbreaks all the time. And that's because, of course, the virus uh, mutates so that um, past infection with an older strain of the virus doesn't induce much protection to uh, new uh, genetic combinations. But uh, given that this is a new virus, COVID-19 is a new virus to humans, it's about equally infectious as uh, the influenza virus, I would say uh, it seems to me from a transmissibility standpoint, the fact that we think people can actually shed the virus uh, before they're symptomatic, the fact that many people are not very sick but can sh uh, spread the virus, I think the odds of this becoming an international health problem are quite high. Exactly, yeah. And from COVID-19 perspective, it does seem as a case of history repeating itself. From, from your examples of SARS, MERS, now COVID-19, with, 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 that, with that historical perspective and probably even with influences as well, what lessons do we need to learn now with COVID-19 and apply them now in order to prevent, if not reduce the likelihood of any similar outbreaks going forward? Well, this is why I made the analogy between finding a cure for cancer and, you know, finding a quote curve, uh, cure for COVID-19, let's say. Uh, cancer is a stable target, if you will, and allows the application of uh, science and technology over a long period of time to a specific uh, target pathogen, in this case, cancer. And ultimately, we've obviously made great progress in that area. Uh, I would say largely because the target has managed to stay still. Uh, the point I made with that, uh, you know, picture of the fog of war is that uh, we cannot predict uh, when viruses are going to make the species jump to human beings, there are literally millions of viruses that are probably hiring, hiding in uh, the flora and fauna around the world. And those viruses are changing as part of their evolutionary adaptation to stay alive, if you will, so that um, uh, we're not going to be able to predict, if you will, what the next COVID-19 was going to be. On the other hand, it would seem to make sense that we develop uh, more generic public health strategies to deal with these types of uh, pathogens. This is exactly uh, what President Obama attempted to do after the Ebola scare, is to set up an infrastructure in the United States that can deal with new pathogens wherever they arise and that they uh, basically can rapidly respond uh, at the time. The best we can do is early detection and rapid response because we're probably not gonna be able to prevent these things from happening. Now, having said that, common sense would suggest that uh, uh, closer attention uh, to the possibility of viruses making the species jump from animals to humans might make sense. This usually even makes economic sense. So that, for instance, uh, in places that have large numbers of animals, like a, like a chicken farm or a, a beef farm or a, a pork raising facility, that they uh, uh, take steps to decrease the likelihood that any viruses can go from one uh, individual to another or from uh, animals to humans. Uh, and that's already being done in the, if you will, in part as part of the industrialization of our food chain. Uh, let us also point out that uh, uh, rebuilding the public health infrastructure in all of our countries is very important. And, you know, politicians like to say, well, you know, uh, you know, it hasn't happened before. Well, yes, it has, and it will again. Uh, and uh, our, in the United States, our public health infrastructure has really been deteriorating for decades. Uh, the public health nurses that are at the backbone of that are uh, retiring. They've not been replaced. Uh, we need to strengthen agencies like the CDC, strengthen uh, basic research uh, 
uh, such as that that takes place in the National Institute of Health, we're already seeing some of the benefits of that research uh, that was done in MERS and SARS. And people could have made the argument, well, why are we worried about MERS and SARS? They're gone now. <laughs> well, if people hadn't continued to work on uh, mechanisms uh, to understand their transmission, to understand how they might be treated, to understand how they might be prevented, we wouldn't have even the possibility of coming up with uh, new tools to uh, address COVID-19. And finally, we as a human population have to become a little more cognizant of the danger of infectious diseases. I mean, how many of us, uh, you know, uh, when we're sick, still go to work? Uh, how many of us, you know, when we are sneezing and coughing, uh, you know, uh, uh, granted, I hope we, we cover our mouths, et cetera, but uh, recall that we're not very good at personal hygiene and in that sense, and other uh, societies, if you go to Asia, for instance, uh, part of the uh, normal proper behavior is if you are sneezing and coughing, you wear a mask. Uh, this has been going on for a long time and we don't do that in the United States. So uh, we're gonna have to, change our behaviors. We're going to have to strengthen our public health. We need to continue to invest in basic science and applied research, and we need to uh, work together. Probably the most important issue is no health problem in the world is one country's problem now, and we need to uh, work effectively together, and I think strengthening organizations like the World Health Organization is the best way to do that. Thank you very much, Dr. Rawls. Certainly, the issue of COVID-19 is a global health issue as we engage this emerging and continuing burden understanding that no one country is responsible or is also an authority in this regard it requires that global effort for us to in fact have the effective response that we do want. As part of Dr. Ohl's presentation today the discussion will continue in our discussion forum so you can feel free to get on board and we will have an interactive experience sharing experiences and commenting on each other's thoughts and ideas and opinions as it relates to this particular presentation. Dr. Owens will no doubt join us once again as we prepare a live panel discussion or question answer and further discussion as we progress this examination in this course with the disease at the same time. Dr. Rose, thank you very much. We appreciate your, your experience as an infectious disease specialist and certainly your thoughts on what are some of the realities as an emerging infectious disease, but also what are some of the recommendations that institutions, countries, internationally, we need to take on board in response. My pleasure. Thank you very much. And with that, folks, that's it for the first session in our examination of COVID-19. And join us in our next session as we delve further into the microbiology of this novel coronavirus particle, COVID-19.